everybody. If you're in the sound of my voice or hearing the sound of my voice, go ahead and grab a seat if you haven't, if you're outside doing, if you're wrenching. You can keep wrenching, I guess. That's a fine thing to do in a nice evening like tonight. Um, but if you want to come in and hear more about Henry, then come on in and let's get this bad boy started. So, guys, uh, to introduce myself really quick, my name is uh, Eric Vandesteeg. I go by Dutch. That's the Vandesteeg part. Uh, and a little piece of history on me is I'm a uh, owner, co-owner of Scamper Van. You guys saw the big orange van on the way in. Uh, also been on motorcycles since I can remember, about six years old, so big time motorcycle fan. I've got two in the garage right now and been following Jared and the guys with Brother Moto for as long as you guys probably have since uh, the old spot and, and a big part of that. So um, found Henry on a uh, podcast and saw that he was riding from Movember and I uh, thought that was a really big, really cool thing that he was going to jump out and do. And we can talk more about him uh, about that. And so I saw that he was doing for November. And I'm actually a recent um, a survivor of testicular cancer myself. And I was like, man, this is so great. I didn't know what November was. I didn't know at all what they were doing. Um, and I thought, this is really great. This is a cool opportunity for, A, us to get together, talk about um, what Henry is doing and how hard he's working because this is a hard job uh, riding around the world and we can talk more about it. So without further ado, Henry Crew, come, come on up and he's up. Just give me a round of applause. So Henry, thank you for joining us tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your, uh, your long ride uh, to join us. So. Um, yeah, yeah, nice to be here. I hate using a microphone, I so know. this is super awkward. But um, <laughs> One thing I've learned about Henry is that he is, does not like to be the center of attention for <laughs> such an adventure, right? You spend a lot of time, I think, solo on a bike. Um, so what has that part been like for you? Interesting. Um, yeah, I'm used to just kind of going under the radar, mm -hmm. trying not to be picked up by police and customs officers. So it's <laughs> weird when people actually want to talk to me. Um, but yeah, getting used to it. Um, it's easy to talk about something that's been my life for the last 11 months and 47,000 miles so, and something I love so much, motorbikes. Yeah. Motorbike people are good as well, easy to talk to. And so let's tell a little, talk a little bit about how you got started, right? I think a lot of us are or have had that wanderlust where we're like, man, get me on my two wheels and let's get going, get me out of here. Uh, how did it start? Wow. Um, I'd been planning smaller bike trips for a long time. I've been riding for about four or five years now, I'd say. Um, and yeah, I've been planning these smaller trips that never happened because I was working like 60, 70 hour weeks. And it, um, a lot of it was freelance. So if I didn't, if I took the time off work, I wasn't earning any money. And yeah, it all fell through. Was never really into the adventure bike thing. I'd always had custom like bikes. My first bike was a 82 XS400. Um, read an article about Kane, who currently has the record. I was sat at work, super frustrated, um, thinking about all these trips that I wasn't going on. And uh, yeah, read it. That was the first time I'd realized I could break the record and decided there and then that was the, that was the way that I was going to be able to travel on a bike was, was um, breaking the world record. And uh, 10 months later, I was leaving and I still feel as unprepared as I did then. Um, <laughs> so, and I mean, th think about that, right? So uh, take us through a little bit about that. You're at your desk. Um, what was it like? I mean, your first thought was, wow, I, I can break this record. And that's, that was the trigger point. And then what came after that? The preparation? Yeah, so I read the article and turned to my mate Glenn at work and was like, I'm going to leave in about 10 months and ride a motorbike around the world. And started emailing people that night, trying to get sponsors involved, um, sent an email off to November and was like, I want to do this, would love to raise money for you, having ridden in the DGR for the last four years um, and having had my own issues with mental health as well, it was a cause that I could really relate to. Um, they raised money for testicular cancer, prostate cancer and men's mental health as well. Um, yeah, had a meeting with them, kind of started getting interest from different companies, um, applying for visas, took a long time. I got like, I think it was three injections a week for six weeks to get all the vaccinations done. Um, all of the customs work for the bike and all of the stuff you don't realize is a thing when you decide to do this on a whim, sat at work. 
um, yeah, you kind of realize this maybe it's a bit more work than I anticipated. So it took every bit of those 10 months for you, or? It was really you, you strange. Could... It was stop start the whole time um, because you'd have times when you couldn't do anything because you'd submitted for a visa and you had to wait two weeks for that to come back. So you have no passport um, and you can't apply for another one. And then the passport would come back and you'd have a day to get all the forms filled out and submit the new visa document so that you wouldn't be delayed. Um, and yeah, waiting for replies from people on email and people to confirm that they want to be involved with the trip. So um, it was difficult. And I was working full time the whole time. Uh, so yeah, it was tricky to kind of fit it all in. And then to, and you said you'd talk to Movember, right? And so you just said that they're great for one of the only international companies taking care of men's health, which as guys, you probably know, we don't talk about things. We're not like, oh man, my balls hurt, <laughs> you know, or anything else. It's just like, no, you just deal with it, you move on. Uh, and so to have an organization like that, that's actually international and doing things like this is, is super important. Um, and you just mentioned kind of why you made that decision, yeah. uh, which I think is fantastic. And then, you know, fast forward from that, right? You made the decision, you met with Movember yeah. and they got you with, hooked up with Ducati Eventually, yeah, that, they came on board kind of late. There was a few other companies that were involved uh, or we were kind of sounding out before. Um, but originally I'd planned to ride on a Kawasaki W800, which I was riding back home, and maybe a month into planning the trip, I wrote it off, um, like big crash on my way home from work, cracked the engine in half, um, so that wasn't going anywhere, and needed a bike for the trip. Uh, so when I met them, this was like, oh, I have this amazing plan, um, but I do need a bike. Uh, so that, that took a long time uh, to sort out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been strange. It's been great working with them and I've learned a lot and the whole thing is talking about the issues like you're saying and that's something that I never did before. So the, the first time I'd spoken about mental health was in an international video for BBC Three, um, which is an interesting way for your family and friends to find out about stuff that you've just been dealing with on your own. Um, but it was so much easier for me to talk to, talk to people I didn't know, talk to a camera that was faceless, than to talk to someone that you feel that you're letting down or disappointing or um, is, is going to affect the way that they think of you because of the, the information that you're giving them. Um, but since then, it's become a lot easier. Once you get over that initial hurdle, uh, yeah, I've, I've, it doesn't phase me at all now. That's, and that's uh, it's a big part, just being able to talk about it. That's, that's huge. Yeah, definitely. Because they, they raise money for, and fund research for testicular and prostate cancer and mental health to an extent. But a huge part of the mental health thing is campaigning for awareness and the reduction of ignorance around um, and the stigma around mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's great. And I've, I've, um, it's been really rewarding for me to talk about it because you get response back from people that have never spoken about it before saying... It's great to see someone speaking about it publicly, especially in a way that they can relate to just being just some kid that's decided to ride a motorbike for a very long time. A very long time. And, take, and I think a lot of the questions too, when you talk about uh, making a trip around the world, um, you'd met with a couple different bike dealers, right? Mm -hmm. And it, what was that like? Um, what, Ducati bike dealers? Well, either Ducati or, or did you, didn't you also have some other Yeah, other so originally Harley-Davidson were going to sponsor their trip and they were going to co customize a Sportster into something pretty similar to this. And uh, then that fell through when their new 2018 Softail range came out. They got super busy. Um, Norton offered a bike. Royal Enfield offered a bike. And I kind of remembered the Desert Sled sort of late in the game and decided that that was the bike I wanted. And we went after Ducati and luckily they said yes. Um, so yeah, that's their bike. They got it with 2,000 miles on. It was a press bike before and um, yeah, it's been great. I love it. It's awesome. And what, uh, have you had any issues yet so far yeah. with the bike? Yeah, we've had issues. Um, so they had an, a known defect with the clutch. So that went out 20 days into my trip. Um, I rode 2,000 miles through Kazakhstan with no clutch. Um, and there was only one dealer in the country, so I got to the south of Kazakhstan and had to wait a month for a new one to be shipped out. So, what gear were you in? Uh, oh, no, you just banged <laughs> All of them. it the whole time. Um, yeah, and couldn't accelerate too fast because it would slip. Mm -hmm. um, 
so it just sucked. Um, but it's, that, that's been fine since the replacement. And I had, the main issue is dealers in developing uh, markets because they sell super bikes to rich people who don't ride them, so they never have to service them. Um, and you take a bike in with 40,000 miles on it, and they're like, what do we do with this one? Um, so I was burning tons of oil in South and Central America and taking it to the service centers and saying something's wrong, and they'd change the oil in the filter and tell me everything was fine. And I'd be like, no. Um, so that carried on until I got to Louisiana, and the oil pump had broken and just destroyed everything. Um, so that was another three-week wait there. So was that a total rebuild? I mean, that was a new engine. It was quicker just wow. to get the new engine in than to um, rebuild it. Um, wow. I had, I don't know, it's, they like to swap things rather than fix them. So I had a leaking fork seal in Thailand, and they replaced the forks rather than f replace the fork seal. Um, <laughs> it's got a, uh, the rear brake master cylinder is from the, Ducati Scrambler from the Venom movie, so it's a Hollywood bike as well now. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, just kind of robbing parts from people along the way. Um, wow. But it's been pretty solid. It's never left me stuck anywhere. And I spoke to Charlie Borman before the trip, and on their long way round and long way down trips, they had full engine rebuilds on both the BMWs. And that's the kind of stuff you don't hear about. No. I like to be honest about it. Even I didn't know that either. On the yeah. I didn't share any of that. Um, yeah, people ask me what's gone wrong with the bike, and I'm quite happy to talk about it, yeah. just as long as they're aware that like the BMW GS that everyone thinks is indestructible and can, is the bike you should, should do the trip on. Right. Um, it's not the case. It has the same issues. Yeah, Basically, I mean, everything is going to have issues when you're putting you that kind like of shit, damage. Right. It's going to break. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's done the third and second highest roads in the world. It's ridden in 125 degree Fahrenheit through like two feet of water. Um, and it's still just about going. Yeah. Um, 48,000 miles on the clock now. Man, 48,000. And then, you know, kind of transitioning to that, so raise your hand if you're a gearhead or you're a trip head. You want to hear about the trip? All of it? All of it? All right, cool. Uh, so since we're on the bike, uh, bike talk right now, we'll transition real quickly about the gear. Um, because I know, for me, I'm a bit of a gearhead too, and it's always like, man, what are they, what are they, what are you packing? How do you pack? What do you pack? 900 YouTube videos of like, you know, what are they doing and how are they doing it? So take us quickly through all your gear because we had the bike next to us. We went through how the bike handled. Um, what's your favorite piece of kit, favorite piece of gear? Um, Mike? I think fuel cans are like the, the favorite thing that I carry because they save my bacon so many times. Which one was that? The fuel cans. Oh, your fuel cans? Like yeah. I, and now I'd put a small fuel can on any bike I own. Um, but in terms of gear, I mean, it's a lot of clothes, a lot of camera gear, um, tent and sleeping bag, and uh, carrying straps for if your bike breaks or you get a puncture and you, that you can't fix or you run out of petrol and you can need to put it in the back of someone's truck. Ah. Carrying, like, strap-down ties has been really hand, handy. Um, puncture repair kit. I converted the wheels to tubeless so that I can just plug them. Nice. Um, How so many plugs great. so far? At one point, I had one tire with about six plugs in it, um, and it always happens to the same tire, and then you just go through tires without a problem, but I don't like to, to say without a problem too much because <laughs> I'll roll out with a new tire and get a flat straight away. Um, I don't know. The heated gear, that's an that's mm. amazing thing. I've got a Gerbing heated loop on the, on the bike, so I plug in my jacket and gloves mm -hmm. and then ride in 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's all good. Man, um, have you forgotten the gear and like walked off the bike? By the way, guys, I know I said Q&A, but yeah, if you have questions along the way, because we're going to cover a lot of topics, feel free to raise your hand. If it, gets, if it gets unwieldy, I'll probably just keep moving on, but we do want to have some interactivity, so everybody's sure. excited. So, Chris, right? Yeah, sure. question. Okay, so you said that your tires are tubeless, but you had spoke rims, so how did um, what we do is we just never adjust the spokes and hope they don't leak. Um, I, re I re replaced the valve for a sports bike valve with an O-ring on it, so th that was the only part of the wheel that leaked. Um, so yeah, this has been running tubeless for 40,000 miles, um, and whenever people ask me if they want to, if I want them to check and adjust the spokes, I just tell them not to touch anything because <laughs> I, I like it that way. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not had any issues. All right. Joe, I think you had a question. Sort of the same question. How did you, you didn't get hurt when you did this? No, I just, I was in Kazakhstan and I got a puncture which literally shredded the tube and I couldn't get another one. So I, I, it was like, I wonder if this will ride tubeless. Because it's a, it's a tubeless rim, like the, um, the, the bead is the same angle as a tubeless tire. And the tires, it comes with a tubeless. It just doesn't have any tape over the spokes. Um, and yeah, the valve was the only, the only bit that leaked. So put the O-ring valve on and it's been fine ever since. Well, initially I just taped up the valve, um, just like made my own O-ring out of um, duct tape and then we got, got to civilization and, and put a proper one on. But it's been fine, yeah. Good. Yeah, uh, carrying reserve fuel, is that those red containers? Yeah, so both, both of the red cans, they're 1.75 gallons each. Um, this one's now got a hole in it, it exploded in Australia, or like it cracked and started spraying fuel all over the exhaust, um, which was like rushing to pull it off and then realize now that you're also covered in fuel and very flammable. Um, so that was pretty sketchy. And now I just use this one to keep my um, bag away from the exhaust. Um, but yeah. Why do you use that type versus I see some of the long distance guys have the metal ones, they have strapped to the back of the cane. Why do you use those versus those metal cans? And these ones are rotor packs, so they have a really good mounting system. Um, they've got a hole in the middle and a, a bar comes through and you just twist it to lock it in. So you can take them off really quickly. Um, they're really light. And um, I mean, I decided that I'd probably need some fuel two days before leaving. So it was whatever would come next day delivery and I could bolt on as, as easily as I could. Um, but I mean, in Kazakhstan, I was riding in there, was no fuel station for 450 miles. So it was every day, every fuel stop, I'd be using both cans just to get to the next gas station. We're going to talk about the trip in a minute. We're just talking about gear now. Because I had a question about well, trip planning. I mean, are you using a sat nav? Are you using maps? Is I've used Google Maps the whole, the whole way, the whole, the whole world, Google Maps. And I have Maps Me as a backup. So I download Google Maps offline if I don't have a SIM card, and then I'll download regions on Maps Me as well, which is, it works solely offline. Um, but yeah, Google Maps the whole way around. Everyone was like, you'll need a sat nav, and I'm like, ah, we'll see. I can always pick one up along the way, and then I had no problem, so just kept using it, and yeah. Now do you check with your, using your, so you're using your phone, mm -hmm. and that's also your communication, so keeping that charged up, and then yeah. is there, I, I can't see from here, so you just live in the bag, and you yeah, look through that? Yeah, the, the USB, there's a USB socket under the seat, and I just ran a USB cable, or the charging cable under the tank and up to the front, and I have a spare one as well, but that died after like a couple of weeks. It was meant to be waterproof, it's obviously not, um, yeah, don't buy an Oxford USB charger, they don't work. So on the, uh, you talk about your trip planning, um, just to make that transition. Do you have, uh, I mean, in all the planning you did, did you plan all the roads? Because it seems like, you know, we were chatting and you'd be like, well, I'm going here. I may be going here. And it's been open-ended. And all the time, you're also trying to break this record. So how much, how far ahead do you plan? Um, a couple of days, maybe. I have, when I started, I knew which countries I wanted to go through. I had major cities that I knew I need to pass. And for the record, you have to hit two antipodal points, which are opposite each other on the globe. So I had those planned out. And to explain that again real quick, the yeah, two points. Yeah, so um, antipodal points, if you drilled a hole from one point and straight down, it would come out at the other one. So you have to work those out before because there's not a lot of them. Um, mine was the border crossing to Malaysia and a town called Chicleo in Chile. Um, a lot of people do Spain and New Zealand. Um, a lot of the time it ends up in the middle of the ocean. So those are things you really have to know that you have to hit that point before. And the rest of it I just made up can, based on what I wanted to see. Um, and I'm pretty flexible on both t deadlines and where I stop and what bits I go through. Uh, I knew I had 13 months to complete the trip and kind of wanted to take about 10 months to do it. And then I'm 11 months in now, and I'll be back at 12 months. So it, it's been a case of finding places I liked and wanted to stay more, and also allowing for delays, um, of which there's been a few. So yeah, I'm, I'm just flexible. I didn't have a plan from crossing from West Coast to East Coast in America. Um, 
I knew that the weather was going to be debatable, and so I've kept pretty south and, and not really seen the northern states so much. Um, and it's been like that the whole way around. If, if the weather's crap, I'll just press on and get out of there as soon as possible. And border crossings tend to be one of those things that take a lot of time. So is that something that you a plan for? And has there been, you know, do you have any good border crossing stories for us? Yeah. Um, well, I'd never done one before because in Europe, we, we, you just, there's no checkpoints. So you can ride from England to all the 21 countries in Europe and um, the Scandinavian countries as well with no ch passport checkpoints or no customs checkpoints. Um, and I got to Ukraine and Ducati had sent me a photocopy of the registration for the bike and found out pretty quickly that wasn't going to cut it. So I had to come back into Poland and wait a day for them to send the, the, the real one out. Um, so that was kind of a failure on the first border crossing. After that, it was kind of fine. Um, and I didn't have any problems at all until I got to Central America. And then people started questioning because the bike is not in my name. Um, and I had a letter saying from Ducati um, that it's fine for international travel. Uh, and they started complaining it wasn't a legal letter and it just making issues because it wasn't in my name. So to get into, I think it was um, Costa Rica. I, I have a customs document for the bike which is in my name and it's pretty much a copy of the registration with some extra information on it. So I just told them that that, that was the registration and they let the bike in. Um, which is weird that they accepted it halfway through the conversation as soon as I realized they weren't going to let it in. I was like, oh, I also have this. Um, and then in Mexico, they wouldn't let the bike in. I'd got the legal document by that point and they wouldn't let it in because I didn't work for Ducati. And they said they were not going to let it in unless it says that I'm an employee. Um, and this was at 6 p.m. Mexico time, which was like 2 a.m. in the UK. And I was like, I can't go back because I don't have a visa to return to that country and I can't get into Mexico. So I went back into the waiting room of the customs office, got my laptop out and photoshopped the document and literally it had the same date. Everything was exactly the same. And then I had a line on the end that says, Henry's working for our press department. Um, and then took that back to them and was like, oh, it, it may, it's 2 a.m. there, but they really like me and they've sent, sent me this document. They were like, yep, that's fine, go through. And I was, I was in within 20 minutes. <laughs> that's right. That is fantastic. What a great, and I, you know, I've heard some other stories in that vein where a lot of, you get to a lot of border crossings and they don't care necessarily about the document. They just want to check the list and say, I've done my job, I'm supposed to ask for this, check and move on. I think it's a good example of that. And I would say before you go on a trip where you're crossing borders, learn Photoshop because it's helped me a couple of times along the way. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's pretty sketchy, but um, they're, just, they're just being so bureaucratic and um, they don't actually care. It's not going to affect their life at all. There's no computer registration, so there's no tracing the bike. You just have to get past that gatekeeper um, and yeah. By hook or by crook, you kind of just got to get the bike across. And then, and he, you know, again. I have one more question along this line. In a lot of the countries you've gone through, there's obviously a border crossing, but then once you get into the interior, there's uh, let's just use what we call an informal border crossing, yeah. or informal checkpoints, etc., where a license fee is required. What's the etiquette in a situation like that? Do you get on the bike, take your helmet off? Yeah. The drill? It depends how you're feeling on the day and how many guns they've got. Um, like in India, there's a lot of checkpoints, and they they're actually military checkpoints, especially when you get in the Himalayas because it's a contested war zone. Um, I mean, the police in certain countries are super corrupt, and they'll just pull you over because they see your license plate and they see dollar signs. Um, so I had a couple of times where they're asking for a bribe and it's quite evident that they're asking for a bribe but um, depending on your position sometimes they've got your passport on their dash and at that point you're probably going to have to pay the bribe um, and other times if you're not in a rush that day you can sit there for 45 minutes and eventually they'll give up but yeah border crossings and when you get stopped by the police it's normally take your helmet off and just smile and just act like an absolute idiot and they'll get fed up because time's money for them. Um, normally it's like 
ten to twenty dollars for a ride, um, but it, it just varies by country. I, I had one in Russia where they just wanted a pound, like um, the English money, um, because they had a collection from everyone that they've stopped and robbed along the way. But they don't see it like that. It's strange. I had a guy, I had a police officer in Kazakhstan, and my second or third day driving through in the middle of nowhere, and I had no fuel left, and he pulled me over just because he wanted to rev the bike, and felt so entitled that he could stop me, and like, like he couldn't speak any English, um, but he was basically, I couldn't speak Russian, he was turning, he wanted me to turn the bike on, so I turned it on, and he just sat there like redlining it, and I had no fuel left, and I'm seeing the exhaust like spitting stuff out, um, and I managed to get to the fuel station, and I had, I think, a quarter of a litre, so, a quarter of a quarter of a gallon. Um, yeah, it was a close call. But I don't know, you get that everywhere. It's like certain people feel like <coughs> you owe them something or they have the power to do whatever they want. Generally, though, would you say that people are. Oh, one, one second. I want to ask this follow up question and I'll come over there. Uh, would you say that people in general that you've met have been amazingly helpful or you've run into more issues like that? Yeah, definitely. The only arseholes that I've met have been working for the governments. <laughs> Which documentation do you need in a second language? Do you need any documents in a second language? Yeah, so the, I have an international driver's license, which in the UK you can just get from the post office, and that has it in uh, over 20 languages. So um, I haven't actually been asked for that at any point, but that's there. Um, I'm pretty sure the customs document is in a couple of different languages. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. My registration's in English, but you can just kind of point it out. And they, they see so many of them that they kind of know where stuff sits. Um, but the language thing's just a case of pointing and gesturing and you'll get there eventually. I try and learn the basics like um, gasoline, toilet, um, hostel, hotel, or like camping um, and food. And then uh, normally I'll print out a sheet and have those written down so that if I can't remember it, I can just point to the one that I need. Um, but I mean, you get, you get what you want from it's pretty easy to, to get your point across. Um, and if I have a SIM card as well, Google Translate is amazing. Uh, it just depends on the country. If I'm not there a long time, then I won't bother getting a SIM card. Yeah. Um, you'd be surprised at how good the signal is in like places that you wouldn't think there'd be any technology. Because they kind of skip the whole computer thing and have only really had access to the internet in the last 10 or 15 years and smartphones are their first um, kind of dive into that. Data is super cheap and signal is everywhere. Um, and in India, I paid about $2 for unlimited data for a month and Kazakhstan was a crazy amount of gigabytes for, for about the same price. And you get signal in most places. Uh, but if I'm not there a long time, it's just waiting for that time when I get Wi-Fi and then I'll download like three or four days ahead and then hopefully I'll get Wi-Fi again along that point. Um, but McDonald's is like, you, you make sure that you know there's a McDonald's somewhere because they always have free Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, they've been really helpful. Big up McDonald's. Was there a time that, uh, that you were really scared along the trip? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of times. Most of the time it's more psychological and preconceptions that you have about a place. Um, when I crossed into Russia, um, the UK media was like, oh, we're on the brink of the new Cold War. All the government travel advisories were like, don't go to Russia. And I had to because my visa was about to expire and if I didn't cross through then, I wasn't going to cross through at all. And I'd have to go back to the, the UK to get a new visa. Um, so I crossed in. Everyone else had this kind of piece of paper, customs document, and they were all filling it out, and I didn't get one. Uh, so I was asking for one, and they were really blunt with me, and I had to wait like half an hour before anyone would, would come and speak to me again. And when they did come back, there was three like massive Russian dudes, like way over six foot, and built pretty, pretty stocky as well. And they were like, follow us, um, in Russian. But I got, the, I got the message, and followed them, and they took me to this kind of cabin around the back of the customs office. And I was like, this is shady. All of the blinds were closed. 
Um, they opened the door and asked me to walk in. I walked in. Three guys come in, shut the door behind me, and I was like, this is about to go horribly wrong. Um, and then they were all laughing and joking and, and helping me fill out the customs form. And they would, well, I found it super funny that I couldn't speak Russian and it was all fine. But that five minutes leading up to it, I was like, this is really bad. Um, yeah, I had a couple of points where like, didn't think I was gonna get through a checkpoint or that someone's really irate. Um, I was in the back of a pickup truck in Pakistan going to get a document so I could leave this region. And there's maybe four or five people from the army there, all with AK-47s bouncing up and down on their lap in the back of this van, and I'm just waiting for one of them to go off and just shoot holes through everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I've never felt super unsafe, not for more than five, ten minutes, and then you kind of rationalize everything. The, the main thing is people live normal lives in these places every single day, um, and, and you kind of get a feel for that. Um, and I mean, if they can do it every day, I can do it for a few hours and get through it. It's not, not a big issue. Um, I think I'm kind of anon anonymous with the helmet and everything, but also um, vulnerable. And I think people acknowledge that. And I've just met super great people the whole, the whole time around. I don't apart from a couple of bribes and stuff. Um, I've never met a, a bad person, a, a bad person that didn't work for the police or, um, or, the, or the border checkpoints and stuff. And you think that the bike has helped that because of the vulnerability? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, especially with a big yellow plate, you stick out like a sore thumb, even in the US. Um, and then you take it to places where everyone's just riding 50cc or 125s, and you're, you're like an attraction, um, and everyone wants to talk about it. Um, yeah, I've not had any issues. And I think as long as people aren't threatened by you, which I think is hard to be, I mean, in Western culture, we have this thing of bikes being threatening or bikers being threatening, but over there, they, they don't have that because they, they don't have any of that history. Um, as, and being on your own is like a funny foreign person walking around. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's helped a lot. The, uh, we, we, before, we were talking a little bit about London and getting, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but the, getting some younger generations and, and riding motorcycles is another issue as well, just making sure we keep bikes going and keep people interested in riding motorcycles because that's what it's going to take. And we were talking a little bit about uh, London, so just kind of talk us through a little bit of the landscape of what it's like riding in London and, and, and what, that, what that feels like for you. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's pretty sketchy at the moment. There's a lot of bike theft. Um, so you'll pull up to a stoplight and you're just super aware of having like three exit points because people will just come block you in and bike jack you. Um, and you can't leave your bike without a lock on it, which is crazy because I've, I've locked my bike up maybe twice on this whole trip in places where people are, are super scared. Um, I mean, a lot of the time I've taken it into a hostel and it's been inside, um, but if I've stopped for lunch, I've not put the, the padlock on it. And in London, if you leave it for an hour, it, you'll come back and it's not there. Wow. Um, and so, I mean, but otherwise, outside of London, I mean, even in the States and uh, the US, you've been, you felt, Pretty safe then, yeah. Even with the gear on top, or is, it, is there a, a yeah. something that you go? Is there a process you go through when getting off the bike and going in somewhere? So I got given this backpack in Australia, and, and previously I had my laptop and camera in the side bags, and um, they would just get damaged a lot when the, when the bike got dropped. Um, got dropped? Not I didn't drop it. Um, <laughs> so I, I started using the backpack and was also aware that when I got to South America, I'd be able to take it off really easily, and that's the only valuable stuff I, um, I carry. The rest of it's all replaceable. Um, if someone wants to nick my dirty laundry, they can. Um, and the tent and stuff, it's not super expensive to buy a new one. Uh, but I, apart from, I had a baseball cap stolen off my bike in Iran, and that's the only thing that's been taken off my bike when I've left it somewhere. Um, so yeah. Was I mean, there anything that you lost, left behind? Yeah, I mean, I, I lost my helmet and then it got stolen. Um, I left my wallet in a taxi in India and then that got stolen. Um, so it's pretty much, I'm super forgetful. So that's something, it's been one of the most challenging parts of my trip, it's, especially when you're super tired, um, being aware of everything you're carrying with you and making sure you don't leave stuff behind. Um, the chain now is not happening again. It was a nightmare. It took me like two months to get replacement cards and licenses and 
stuff like that. It was only like twenty dollars in cash, um, but so chain wallet would be one of those other necessities. Yeah, get something that's stuck to you. Um, I have a fake wallet as well, which okay. I've not had to use, but everyone that I met. Um, had said like just carry a fake wallet and when you leave a country and you can't convert the money um, or just keep one bill from each country and start filling that wallet up with that so that it looks like real a real wallet and then if you get mugged or whatever you can just whip that out instead um, but luckily I haven't had that experience they're called steel core straps the straps got a a steel core, um, so you, you can't cut through it very easily. But within a week, both of the locks had broken. Um, so it's, it's like the weakest link, which is, is really frustrating because it's a great concept. Um, but it's, it's literally just a, a tiny couple of millimeter metal tab that you, you twist around. And I think the first time I caught it or someone clipped me as they drove past and it just ripped it straight off. Um, so if you wanted to get into it, you can get into it in a minute with a screwdriver and a hammer. So it kind of defeats the object of having the steel core in the first place. But they're a kind of a visual deterrent, I guess. Um, and they, they keep everything in place. I just wish they should just put two loops on it and then you can put your own padlock through it. It would be easier. Yeah. Speaking of people flipping you, how many times have you almost died? And what did you do to avoid almost um, <laughs> countless times. How are you alive right now? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's difficult and it changes from country to country. So some places is so close quarters like India um, that people will be clipping you the whole time, especially with a vehicle this wide um, because everyone's on bikes and trying to squeeze through and they'll just be dragging the bike alongside you. Um, so it helps to not be precious about your vehicle um, and not owning it helps. Um, but the... I know, uh, my, my riding style changes depending on the country. Um, every, every place is different. Even in America, I'm not used to driving with massive trucks on the road. And um, it's pretty strict in Europe for undertaking. You can only overtake on one side and people pretty much stick to that. So here I find, like I'll be riding along and then suddenly I'm surrounded by either pickup trucks or lorries and just completely boxed in and everyone's on their phone swerving over. Um, which is something I've not really had to deal with in other places. And then India, you've got just huge volumes of traffic, so you're riding really aggressively. Um, everyone's using their horn, and then you get to Thailand, and no one uses their horn, and it's really offensive if you honk at someone. Um, so it's kind of adapting to all of that. And then you get to it. Australia was the first country I've been in that kind of had civilized traffic for, the, for like six months. So I was riding how I'd been riding in all these other countries, and then very aware of the fact that I'm gonna get pulled over um, f for breaking laws, just trying to stay alive. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. You, you learn to adapt um, pretty quickly. Is there, so you mentioned a couple things about using your horn, because I think that's a super interesting one. Uh, in India, you're, everybody's on the horn all the time, and that's just, it's more like a, hey, I'm coming through. Oh, here you, you're coming through. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, it's almost like a conversation on the road. And in Thailand, you mentioned that it's offensive to use your horn, where I think here we'd all agree that it's a mix of both, right? There's like the, the F you horn and the thank you horn and the wave and all that kind of stuff. So and I think depending on the part of the country as well that you're in, um, how do you find that out? Do you research it before you get into the country or do you? You, you learn it by how many people flip you off after you honk <laughs> at them. Um, it's, it's a weird one in America because people get really angry when I honk at them. But most of the time, I just don't know if, I'm, if I've been seen and it's, it's not really something you want to gamble with. Have they seen me? Because there's high consequences if they haven't. Um, in India, and in pretty much from Russia, they say a honk for hi, a honk for watch out I'm coming through, a honk for I'm overtaking, a honk for get out of my way. It's constant. Um, and no one thinks anything of it. Um, and then, yeah, you come into... Thailand was, you don't honk at anyone, they pull out in front of you, and if you honk at them, they'll stop the car and want to fight you. Um, and then Australia, you, you kind of learn to, to tone it down a little bit. Um, and then South America, again, it's honk at whatever you want, and back into the US, and people seem to take it quite badly. But 
I'm literally, I'm just trying to stay alive. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I try to stay away from the road rage stuff because mm -hmm. it's never going to benefit you in any way. Um, Have you gotten that? Have you gotten into some road rage yourself? Yeah, but it's just keeping it in the helmet and yeah. not letting it come out um, because it's just too dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if you're in a place where you don't speak the language and it's just two people shouting at each other in different languages or um, they can speak to the police and you can't, which is another sketchy one. Um, but even in America, especially with big trucks, and you see all kinds of crazy YouTube videos of people being run off the road, and I'm just, I haven't got time for, for that, that kind of You've stuff. You've got a record to break. Yeah, I think <laughs> I've become be so much more relaxed as well. Like, um, you just learn to accept that you are invisible as soon as you get on a bike, and um, it's not always people's fault. You'll be in their blind spot and they'll cut you up. Um, like it's a balance of riding aggressively and learning when to just accept that they haven't seen you or that it's best just to get out of their way because it's more trouble than it's worth. Mm -hmm. How many hours are you riding now per, per day? It, it varies a lot. Normally, my average is probably between four and eight hours a day. Um, I mean, one day in India, it took me 16 hours to ride 130 miles. Um, and then other days, I can put in a 10-hour day and cover 700, 800 um, yeah, normally between four to eight hours a day, and sometimes that buys you a lot, and sometimes it gets you next to nothing. And with all that saddle time, it looks like it, that is that the original seat, or is yeah, that a... it's the original seat with a new cover on it. I met a guy in Seattle that made leather covers for the bike, and he was like, oh, "I'll put one on." And I was like, "Yeah," um, but I kind of regret it because because it's leather, it's kind of slippery. So mm -hmm. if you slam on the brakes, you you find yourself sliding forward, um, and it's it's just not quite as comfortable because it moves a bit more than the than the plastic one mm -hmm. um but yeah it's the original seat hmm. that's cool and, yeah and then in the back do you uh, strip your bike every night and uh when you're in a hotel or yeah. whatever and also how much are you camping and how much are you staying in hotel shop so i i take every bag off apart from this one on the back but, um it's just got a tent and a blanket in it, so I'm not that fussed if it goes missing. And normally, when I finish for the day, I'm, I just can't be asked. Um, but I, I kind of figured out a system to carry every other bag at one time, so I only have to make one trip up to the, to the room or inside. Um, I'd say I stay with people through social media 60 to 70% of the time, and then maybe 20% hotels and 10% camping. Um, my camping setup is, I have a tent that's tiny specifically for motorcycles. It weighs about a kilogram, so two pounds, two and a half pounds. Um, and it's like a coffin. So it's not, it's not super fun to, to hang out in. So normally I only camp if um, it's decent weather and, or I'm, if I want to, really. How do you deal with the water crossings? Yeah, so I only have to do it three times on the trip. Um, I flew from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to Perth in Western Australia. And yeah, just um, find a freight company. Normally I get it done through Ducati because they ship their bikes from central locations all over the world. So they'll have a pre-existing relationship. And then I can either wangle like a really good deal or try and convince them to do it for free. Um, so I had to pay from Malaysia to Australia. It was about $1,000. And then from the other side of Australia to Chile, I got it for free. Um, and currently working on getting it for free again from New York to Lisbon. But that's yet to be confirmed. So, Same as a commercial flight. Um, so that, that's why I do it on the plane. Because it's like six, six hours if it's a six-hour flight, ten hours if it's a ten-hour flight. And then it will probably take you half a day to get it out of customs at the other side. Um, you can probably, yeah, half a day to get it onto the plane and half a day to get it out of the airport on the other side. Um, but with a boat, they'll, they'll just tell you three, to th three weeks to three months, we don't have a date. And it costs the same. When you get the quotes through, the boat price is always cheaper, but you have to pay a fortune in fees at the port, and they never tell you that. Um, 
So it will look like it's maybe five, six hundred dollars difference, but you'll pay a port fee um, just for using the port. You'll pay a fee for them taking it off the boat. You'll pay a fee for them housing it for a day while you get it out of customs. And then you're back up to the same price and it's taken you three weeks instead of six hours. Question back here. Hey, how are you doing? Nice to see you again. So I met George in, in uh, Melbourne, and uh, he was out there with the Custom Commune guys, which is like a DIY garage like this. Oh, uh, cool. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> um, after $40,000, what's been the greatest experience? Ooh, that's a difficult one. That's a really tricky one. Um, generally, it's the things you can't plan for. Um, the, the way I've been explaining it in the States is I went to the Grand Canyon and I've seen a lot of pictures of the Grand Canyon and you, you walk up and it's so, it, it's big and it's just like the pictures and it, you kind of can't process it because you've, you've seen it in books and stuff for so long. Everyone tells you it's massive and yeah, it's massive. Um, so you, you, I kind of stood there a little bit underwhelmed because it was so overwhelming that you can't digest it. And it's the same for seeing the Taj Mahal. You see so many pictures of it, and it's like, yep, it's really good. It's white and clean, <laughs> whatever. Um, but then it's all the, the stuff that you can't plan for that takes you by surprise, um, whether it's meeting people that have a great story or show you great kindness or show you an amazing place that you've never even heard of before. Um, or this one time in India, we were we were really high in the Himalayas and there was a tiny single track dirt road and all these trucks were trying to overtake each other. And the guy I was riding with there was trying to get through the traffic and I was like, I'm just gonna sit back and wait for it to clear up and it will, 15, 20 minutes and it will, it will be a lot calmer. So I, I sat back and everyone kind of passed and finally it was quiet. And it was just amazing birds like circling above with an amazing backdrop. And it's one of the things that sticks with you. Um, it, it's that kind of thing, or um, just completing little things that you've always dreamed of, or things that take you by surprise, rather than the big seeing this or doing this thing. Um, yeah, and all of the kind of crazy fun stuff along the way. Like I, I lost my glasses in India, another, another case of my forgetfulness, and I hadn't slept for four days, so I'm, I was blaming it on that. I got back on my bike, had taken them off to put my helmet on and left them on the back of my bike and drove off and realized like 15 minutes later, I couldn't really see because I was so tired, so it didn't make much difference. And when I realized we were, we were too far gone and the guys that I had kind of been roped into riding with were these Russian dudes that were like not stopping for anything. Um, so I needed new glasses and taking an eye test in acrylic, an alphabet that bears no resemblance to <laughs> our Latin one, was, was like a fun memory that was really crap at the time. But yeah, um, yeah all of those sorts of small things. That's cool. So, oh, go ahead. I just got two questions, a little unrelated. First, I just want to know uh, if you go heavy on leg gear, leg and foot sometimes. Sorry, go, go heavy on what? Yeah, so I'm, I'm wearing like a full adventure suit. It's piled behind the bike, and I can show it to you later if you want. But um, when I started, I was quite determined to do it on a bike that I'd ride back home in gear that I'd wear back home, and I'd never had any adventure gear before. And Revit sent me out an adventure suit, and I was pretty sure that I was only going to use it when the weather was rough or, I don't know, um, bike quickly found out it's really uncomfortable to ride in jeans for an extended period of time, even if they're bike jeans. Just having the weave on the fabric just irritates your skin after a while. Um, and as well, you get filthy sitting on the road for a long time. And only having one casual outfit, you don't want to be riding in that, sweating in that, getting dirt from the road in that, and then not having anything to change into when you get back. So even though like these are tobacco motorwear jeans, so they're Kevlar lined, and I was wear wearing ugly bros before with the pads in. Um, but if I'm if I'm like a day in the city milling about, I'll be wearing the urban stuff. But if I'm riding for a day, I'm just always in the adventure gear because it's so much more comfortable. Um, and it it's it started out white and it's brown. You'll see it now and. Uh, I can show you photos of riding in India. I ride for a day and my face would be black from the diesel smoke. 
So it's all that kind of stuff. You don't want to be wearing clothes that you're changing into at the end of the day. Just Australia. Um, no, just, yeah, it's expensive because you've got to get the bike there. So I, I rode from UK to Singapore, shipped the bike, rode back to Malaysia and shipped the bike to Australia, rode across Australia and shipped to Chile, and then rode up from Chile to Panama, got the boat, uh, Chile to Colombia, got the boat to Panama, and then rode up from Panama to here. And then fly from New York back to, to Europe and, yeah. Yeah, you just kind of got to deal with it as best you can. Um, most of the time, I'd wear like a neck scarf that you can pull up. Um, there's a company called Rare Bird, and they're, they're based in London, and they make uh, kind of tweed face masks, but they have air filters in them um, for urban use, but I think they'd be quite good um, for any dust and stuff. It's, the only issue is because I wear glasses, covering my mouth just makes the, everything fog up, so it's a bit of a balance. Um, sometimes I tape up the air vents on, on helmets, um, but it, it depends because normally where there's sand it's really hot, so you also want that ventilation, so it's a bit of a balance. Um, I've ridden through a few sandstorms and it literally gets everywhere. You'll, you, you, I've, I have two, three layers on and I have a white t-shirt underneath that will be yellow and just covered in dust. Um, it, it finds a way. The, uh, a couple more questions because we're coming up in an hour and then we'll take some more, uh, some more Q&A from you guys. Um, I think now more than any other time, people are talking about uh, social media and how can I make a living out of, of traveling the world and, and staying in touch with people on social media. And, and, and you, know, you see people now, if, I mean, if you guys are following some other adventure travelers, they're, it's like, how do they do this? They've been traveling the world for years. Um, what's it like knowing that you're four to however many hours uh, on the road per day, uh, and then doing events like this, et cetera. What's it like been balancing, uh, or to try to balance that social media and con contacting people, which is how I reached out to them as well, you know? Yeah. Social media can be really demanding, um, and it's, it's definitely important to evaluate what you're getting from it and putting it out. So I don't really look at it anymore in, in because I'm, what I'm doing is so fulfilling and so time consuming, I'm not looking for inspiration on Instagram anymore. So I don't find myself scrolling through. Um, I mainly just check up on friends every now and again. But um, posting's one thing, not hugely time consuming. You can kind of, editing photo and video is time consuming, but it's something that I enjoy, so it's not a big problem. But messaging people can take a long time. Like some, some days I'll finish and there'll be 30 messages and it will take me an hour, an hour and a half to reply to people. And then I wake up in the morning and the rest of the world sent a message. So it's the same again. Um, and it's balancing the guilt of, of not replying to people or taking a long time to reply to people versus this is my trip that I'm paying for and I'm only gonna experience this once. And a lot of the times I'll see amazing things and be like, oh, it'd be great if I could stop and take a photo, but seeing it is the most important thing and it doesn't actually matter if I show it to other people. Um, it's a weird thing. I try and be as open and honest and uh, not hide the bad days as well because it's so easy to, to think everything's sunshine and rainbows and if I'm having a crap day, I'll post about it and... Um, just be honest so people don't get this false idea that every day is amazing and oh, I wish I was doing that. It's tough. It's, um, yeah, it's like, it's pretty relentless and pretty intense and um, some days are more relaxed than others and other days I do a, a lot of press stuff and um, some days it rains, some days it's freezing cold and some days your bike breaks and um, yeah, it's a lot. I rode with a guy through Australia, and the second day of the trip, he turned to me and said, yeah, this really, really isn't the holiday I thought it was going to be. And I was like, yeah, no shit. It's like, <laughs> it's painful. So uh, any other quick questions? I'm going to move on a couple more things, and we'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, so what's next? I mean, well, first, I want to start with, like, what's left on your trip uh, quickly, and then kind of have you, you know, it's a lot of time in your helmet. Have you thought about what's next for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's... I mean, I've got a month left, 
which is nothing, and it's really scary. There's loads of opportunity, but um, it feels really daunting to have to, to not, like my whole year's been planned. I mean, a loose plan, but I mean, the end goal is to ride around the world and get back to England, so easy enough, you just hop on the bike every day. Um, and I've not had to worry about um, anything else. And now, clock's ticking on, on that one. So it, it, it feels, it's stressful, and a lot of stuff's wrapping up with needing to fly the bike out, needing to organize dates for getting back to places and um, make time for everything else. But I, I have about six months of irregular work off the back of the trip, doing talks and promo stuff for Ducati and, th and that kind of stuff. Um, which is something I've never really done before, but something I do enjoy doing. I'm just kind of getting used to it. Um, and I have a bunch of ideas. Yeah, like you say, it's a lot of time spent in your head thinking about stuff. I'd love to work on a, um, like a, a media show, I guess, for, for motorcycles and create something without all of the arrogant bullshit that you get on Top Gear and um, just normal people having fun on bikes on a super low budget and doing stupid stuff. Um, I have a soft spot for old two strokes and I'd love to get a group of people together, give them like a five grand budget, say buy yourself an old 70s two stroke and we'll ride them a stupid distance and then race them in, there's a race in Athens in Greece called the Rotten Race and it's like flat track, inappropriate flat track. I'd love to ride from London to there and then race in that. Um, I think we have the MX-1000 in this part of the country. Uh -huh. if you guys know, I think Jared, yeah, MX-5, yep. Yeah. So Jared's written that. It's pretty similar to you. You can only have bikes prior to 1980, and then you know, you're on this ridiculous, mostly off-road trek, uh, and I think that was fun to follow. Yeah, so yeah. I think it'd be a blast. But it's just it's a balancing act of, like, I need um, money. <laughs> I need money <laughs> coming in. Like, um, so it's, it's a balance of, of time and how long I can wait out for stuff to come in. But it's been really interesting. I've met some really great people along the way, and... Um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. A lot of ideas. It's just... Either way, this has opened up a whole other world that you didn't have before, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was working in music before I left for the trip, mm -hmm. um, doing branding and marketing and stuff for record labels. And um, it's just an industry full of not nice people. There was an interesting thing the other day after um, Keith from Prodigy died, and James Blunt, of all people, posted this thing saying back in 2000s when he was blowing up with his first album, Noel Gallagher was saying, like, I wouldn't even sit at the same table as him, and Paul Weller was slagging him off, Damon Albarn wouldn't be in the same photo as him, and Keith came up to him and gave him a hug and said, I'm so happy for your success, and there's, uh, he was saying there's no prizes for being a nice person in, in music, and it's so true, and it got so depressing. I was working like 60, 70 hour weeks just to, um, make a normal non-music wage. Um, it's not really something I want to go back into doing. And hanging out at South by Southwest with all the people I used to work with the other day was like, yeah, this just isn't good. You made I'm the right choice. At, yeah, I'm quite good at picking industries with no money in them. So, <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, questions? And we're, we're, once we wrap up here, guys, uh, you know, we're hanging out for a little bit, so you can come up. So I want to give a big thank you to uh, Jared and Brother Moto as well, guys. If you can give them a hand. Um, if you have not, if you have not been here before, it's an awesome place not only for coffee but to rent your bike, get some gear. They've got some of the coolest gear that they design. Uh, so take a look around the shop and please come back and, and patron them. There's not a lot of cool shops, There's none really that in Atlanta like this. Um, so tell your friends, etc. Uh, Henry, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it, um, and thank you again, guys. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks for coming. I appreciate people showing up. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. This is for you guys.